There's only like four people typically on that side. Uh, so big summary, first semester. So what we're moving into is chapter 10, our substitution and elimination. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is what mechanisms we're running through SN1, SN2, E1, and E2, and what conditions facilitated each of those. And in first semester, we typically talk about alkyl halides. Why would I pick alkyl halide to do my substitution or elimination reactions, or at least introduce that concept? It's a good leaving group. What else can the halide do? It can be substituted, so it acts as a good leaving group, okay? Once it's left, it could be a, a nucleophile, okay? Those of you laughing, those of you, you're waiting for me to say something. Actually, I'm not. That's it. That's it for the alkyl halide. We're done. There's no other chemistry associated with it. Its chemistry is so narrow and limited that we can get away with talking about it very generically and not have to stress about all the other reactions that could stack on top of it. However, we're no longer in second semester, which means, let's try that again, first semester. <laughs> we move up to different functional groups. Okay? And we did touch on the alcohol chemistry in first semester, but it's usually not fully kind of explored until we hit into second semester. Okay? So why might oxygen be useful in this structure? Okay? Why would it be synthetically useful? What can those lone pairs that that oxygen, that oxygen has act as? They could act as a base by donating those electrons to hydrogen. hydrogen. What else could they act as? A nucleophile. So a new functional group, our alcohols, could now act as nucleophiles and as bases. Okay, well, in and of itself, that's not a big deal. But due to oxygen's electronegativity, what else can that alcohol now potentially do? If oxygen is electronegative, what can it do? It can withdraw electrons from what? Carbon. From the carbon. If it withdraws electrons, what does the carbon become? More positive, making the alcohol functional group an electrophile. See? See? Where else could it withdraw electrons from? The hydrogen. Meaning the alcohol functional group could also act as an acid. Okay? So alcohols, for this reason, can be excellent because we have access to all of this chemistry. But at the exact same time, what does that mean? We have all that chemistry that we could access. Meaning I could try and run an acid-base reaction and instead it does a nucleophile reaction. Okay? I could try and have it act as a base, but instead it acts as an electrophile. Okay. Alcohol functional groups are very useful synthetically because they have all these directions they can go. However, it can drastically convolute and muddy the waters for running a chemical reaction. So what we're looking at in this chapter is now thinking about those other functional groups when we think about substitution and say, well, what happens when we substitute in other pieces? How does that change my possible chemistries? The alcohol is an example we may not want in our structure because I may want to do an elimination, but because it has an acidic hydrogen, that's going to shut down the elimination pathway. So what could I do to limit some of that chemistry? What could I do to limit the alcohol's acidic chemistry? If I put it in something more acidic and then makes the alcohol act as a base, which then makes it even more acidic, okay. I could remove the hydrogen altogether. So I could react the alcohol with a base. Now it's no longer acidic. Okay. So what I'm going to try and do is remove some of that functionality and be very intentional about the reagents I use to delete, if we will, some of those characteristics. <laughs> Other options, 
I know alcohols are a god-awful mess of chemistry, but I know halides aren't. What could I do? I could do a substitution. Get rid of the alcohol and make it a halide. Now I don't have to worry about all that extra chemistry because the halogen is going to get me access to the chemistry I want, substitution, elimination, and it limits now those other side reactions potentially getting in the way. Right? So the big thing that we could go through and do is focus on the easiest chemistry, which would be the acid-base chemistry. I could add acids, which would protonate the oxygen. Once the oxygen is protonated, what charge would it become? Positive. positive. Does oxygen want to be positive? No. So what does it do if I go through and add an acid? Okay. That enhances the characteristic of that acting as a leaving group. If it acts as a leaving group, what chemistry now becomes accessible? What chemistry happened on the left-hand side? That's all substitution. Okay. What happened to the upper right? God, that big old thing, that looks ugly and awful. What happened up there? That can't possibly be a simple reaction. It's substitution. Okay. What happened to the lower right? We ran an elimination. Okay. So again, we're adding a species to limit some of the characteristics or enhance other characteristics of our functional group so that we can do other chemistry. Why would we do that other chemistry? Well, in the case of the substitution, I'm going to shift to a halide because now I don't have to worry about all the extra crap that the alcohol can do. Right? <coughs> Why go through and generate the functional group in the upper right? What functional group is that? It's not a ketone. It's an ether. What is special about the ether category? What chemistry is now available to that oxygen? What can the oxygen act as in an ether? What does the oxygen have? Lone pair electrons. If it has electrons, what could it potentially act as? A nucleophile or a base. Right, to act as a nucleophile, this oxygen must get into the inside of a molecule. What is all this crap on the outside of the ether? A bunch of electrons, which would? Sterically hinder it. Can the ether act as a nucleophile? No. So it has some base characteristics, but again, the oxygen doesn't want to be positively charged. So what happens? Our functional group of an alcohol that's fairly reactive and can interact with different things becomes an ether, and now all of a sudden, I have no chemistry, okay? or very, very limited chemistry. Okay? So by acknowledging how the structure changes and affects our functional group, we can get a big leap, okay? either backwards or forwards, in what we're trying to achieve. Okay? If we take a look at our activation of our leaving group with our acid, okay, mechanistically, we're looking at a strong acid. The reactive part is H+. Plus. I stabilize the H+, plus with the lone pair electrons. Those electrons, or the bonding electrons between the hydrogen and whatever that conjugate acid are, shift to the conjugate acid. And I would end up with that charged intermediate. Now what could happen? Okay. Oxygen doesn't want to be positive, so it could leave. It could take the electrons from the carbon. Okay. How does it leave? Okay. If the bond breaks on its own, what type of mechanism would we be moving through? Okay. A one-type mechanism. So I heard an SN1. We actually have no idea if it's SN or not, because it could be E1. So it's the one type. We're splitting into two steps. We're getting a carbocation intermediate. Okay. Does it have to form a carbocation? No. What's going to dictate which mechanism we go through at this point? The nucleophile. What is the identity of A? Okay. If A is a strong nucleophile, whoop, that didn't advance the way I thought it was, like iodide, bromide, or chloride, what happens? 
right? That could theoretically do a backside attack at the same time it eliminates, or sorry, kicks out where the water leaves, and we'd be doing a two-type mechanism, and in this particular case, we'd be doing a two-type mechanism that was substitution, okay? Also known as a simultaneous mechanism. If we formed the carbocation first, why would we form the <laughs> carbocation? What could you tell me about A? Okay, it was potentially weak. All of those are negatively charged. They're all not weak. Why would I form the carbocation? What could you tell me about the identity of each of those bonds hanging off the carbon? They were probably all carbons, meaning what kind of carbocation do I have? Tertiary. The tertiary favors a carbocation formation. Right? Once the carbocation is formed, now what could happen to stabilize the carbocation? A minus could come in and attack. Right? That could work great for I minus Br minus Cl minus, okay? or iodide or bromide or chlorides. And that would result in what type of reaction? A substitution, the mechanism being SN1. What if our negatively charged species was SO4 minus 2? Cannot act as a nucleophile. It's negative, it's pretty big. For those of you being, I wonder what that looks like. That's a good question. You should probably draw out the Lewis structure. And if we draw out the Lewis structure, what do we find? There's what? Be more specific than there's just resonance. Fair enough. I was vague. There's a lot of resonance. There is a stupidly large amount of resonance within sulfate. What does that mean happens? The charge is stabilized. If your negative is stable, what can it not act as? A nucleophile, which means can we run the substitution? No. So now what happens? That carbocation would have to find some stability elsewhere. It's not in the identity of A minus. Where else are there electrons? Okay, we could look at the electrons between the hydrogen and the carbon. Technically, the what position? The beta position. And if we removed those electrons, we could shuttle those electrons in towards the carbon, making a... A pi bond, which would be what type of chemical reaction? An elimination. Okay. When we talk about elimination reactions, typically people memorize an extra term with them. They're typically referred to as what type of eliminations? There's a hint, it's not alpha. Beta eliminations. Why? The hydrogen I'm removing is coming from the beta position. Okay. So the name that you hear floated out there has some meaning and an origin behind where it's coming from. So we could get our substitution, we could get our elimination. Okay. Is there another negative floating around, another source of electrons that could stabilize that positive that's not nicely shown on this slide? Hydrogens from the other carbons uh, I think I see what you're saying. Let me go through and draw it on. Let's add it in red, like that hydrogen. Or that hydrogen. Is that what you're saying? Okay. What positions are they located at? Also beta, so I would argue those are all identical. It's still a beta elimination. It's just a question of where the double bond formed. Okay. There's another source of electrons. And this is the one that nearly everybody forgets. Well, this pathway was irrelevant. We said A minus didn't work. 
Okay, that clearly is positively charged, so that doesn't work. So those aren't right. Those aren't right. HA is positive. Where's there another source of electrons? The OH that left? But that was water. That would just take us backwards. No, not the OH that left. The carbon? Nope. The OH that left was pretty decent. You just missed or added some extra words. The OH. Alcohol? The alcohol. But didn't we just remove that? You removed it from how many molecules? One. How many molecules were in the reaction? Billions upon billions. Our starting material can act as a starting material in multiple steps throughout our mechanism. You can't just say, well, I reacted it already. No, you didn't. You reacted one of billions. Right? There's still leftovers. Those leftovers could potentially react. That's how we got, oh, man, I got stepwise back. That's how we got this upper right-hand corner. Where did that extra piece come from? That extra piece is the starting alcohol. An alcohol can react with itself. Why would an alcohol be able to react with itself? The alcohol can act as both a nucleophile, because it has the lone pairs on the oxygen. It could also act as an electrophile, because oxygen's electronegative. Okay. We have to be cognizant of all of those pieces moving through. This is really just kind of easing into, believe it or not, recognizing that your starting material can ra react at multiple times throughout the semester or throughout a given reaction. Always keep that in mind. Okay. When we go through and look at the overall mechanism here, we've got a bunch of different pathways. If we were to go through and summarize which of these was the most likely path, the most light move likely path would be this one going through our one type or our unimolecular pathway. We almost always form the carbocation. Okay. When would we not form the carbocation? If it was SN2, how do I know I should be doing an SN2? It has to do with the alcohol. I'd have to be a primary alcohol. If it is secondary or tertiary, it moves through the unimolecular pathway we're getting SN1 or potentially E1. Okay, so it's almost exclusively SN1. Okay. Uh, I don't want to jump back a whole bunch, but when we looked back at that previous slide where I spidered out, we started with HI, then we had HBR, and then I said HCl. Did it just say HCl? No, it said HCl and zinc chloride. Why do we have to add zinc chloride? What is different? from chloride versus bromide versus iodide? Size, electronegativity. What are all of those species acting as? The nucleophile. Which one's the best nucleophile? It's a little bit weird, unfortunately. Our best nucleophile is iodide. Okay. Part of that comes back to the solvent that we're in. We're in a polar protic solvent. In a polar protic solvent, the larger ion, okay, or the less electronegative ion, is the more nucleophilic. So iodide is a stronger nucleophile, which means do I need to add anything else to help it to react? No, because it's active as it is. Bromide, also pretty large. Chloride, not quite big enough. Which means if I want that reaction to go, what am I going to have to add? A catalyst. The catalyst that I add is zinc chloride. Right? What happens in this? Well, zinc chloride, what charge do you think the zinc is? Positive. What does it need? Electrons. Where are there electrons? On the oxygen. Oxygen reacts with the zinc chloride forming a better leaving group. That better leaving group now allows for the chloride to do the attack. Okay. 
So HCl almost always requires the zinc chloride. Sometimes it's shown there in these substitutions, sometimes not. One of the reasons, or one of the other things that we might see here is that it says a Lucas reagent up at the top. Okay? You might see the name associated with this chemical reaction. The reason it is there is because as a classification test, I can take zinc chloride, a little bit of acid, and add it to an unknown alcohol, and just add some drops in. Okay? If within seconds, like immediately, I see a white precipitate, that white precipitate is the zinc oxide that's forming as a secondary product. Where did the zinc oxide come from? Well, from doing the substitution. So if I see a white precipitate, what does that tell me about the alcohol? Which pathway, which reaction did I say was most prevalent? for all of these. SN1. What can you tell me about the starting alcohol if you know it runs under SN1 conditions? It's a tertiary alcohol because it reacted very fast. Okay. Let's say it takes 30 seconds to a minute. That took a little bit longer to react. It's no longer tertiary. It's probably secondary. secondary. It takes three to five minutes. could be primary, or could, there could be no alcohol altogether. Okay. Why do we use this? Because within five minutes, I know something about the structure. Okay. And you might say, well, don't we have spectroscopy, IR, NMR? Yes, we do. Hydrochloric acid and zinc chloride combined for this test probably costs five cents. To run a single spectra, you would need the instrument. The IR is 20 grand. The NMR is several million. Which test are you going to do? Okay. So when we look at old school synthesis, we almost always went through and did classification tests. The ACS <coughs> is written by old school chemists. So they tend to ask questions that you could theoretically have seen in lab like classification tests. So you may see reference to it. Yes. Yeah. How could it possibly react? If you give it enough time, you will start to see it form. So, and that's one of the things that, when first semester it was either it did or it didn't. In second semester, it's not a question of it did or it didn't. It's that it didn't in five minutes. So I must say it didn't react. Or it did react in five minutes, so I'm going to say it did react. Okay. Almost all of our reactions, given enough time or energy, will proceed to a certain extent. This reaction almost always proceeds in the forward reaction or forward direction. Why might that be the case? So we saw a white precipitate, right? That means the zinc oxide is a solid. All of our reactions are equilibrium reactions, except when we change phases. Why does it matter when we change phases? Surface area contact is now limited. We can't reverse that reaction as easily. So when we go through and look at this one, reverse, whoops, that's not a reversible arrow. Reversible arrow, but the second one is not reversible. As soon as I start to form precipitate, what happens? Oh, I want to continue to form. I've lost that material from my solution. Think back to your equilibrium reactions. You don't put solids in your equilibrium expressions. Okay. As soon as I form solid, it's now starting to shift constantly to the right. So given enough time, I will always see a precipitate here because I'm removing one of the reactants by changing the phase. Okay. What if it doesn't change phase? Now we run under a strict equilibrium depending on where the equilibrium lies that's going to dictate what products we get and how much. In this case, because we're shifting out of phase, we're always going to get products. Okay. That was your 152 review, by the way. Okay. So acid activation, four questions. Give you five minutes. See what you Okay, so let's take a look. 
<clears throat> one of the things that I'm really trying to emphasize in this class is that we have to focus on the chemistry. So every time you look at a reaction, you should think, what is the most reactive thing there? <laughs> So in that very first reaction, what is the most reactive thing there? Everybody else? Okay, hydrogen, good. It's not the alcohol. The alcohol is not the most reactive thing. The hydrogen is the most reactive thing because it's an acid. I now have H plus floating around in solution. So the first thing I need to do is do what? Neutralize the H plus. What do I need to neutralize the H plus? Electrons from the oxygen. Okay. And for those of you saying, well, but if I have the oxygen attack the hydrogen, isn't that doing the same thing? The end result is the same. It doesn't mean the path you used to get there was the same. Okay. One way starts to put you down the path of just raw memorization of facts. The other one is starting to get you to look at just the chemistry and trying to find the patterns. I want you to find the patterns. Okay. So if it picks that up, what would our structure become? We'd have H2O positive. Now what's the most reactive thing? Oxygen. The oxygen being positive. Does it want to be positive? No. So what does it do? It leaves. Okay. This is kind of a big question here. On what mechanism should I go through and do? Should I be going through SN1 or SN2? If I do SN2, what happens? The bromide comes in and attacks, and I'd end up with this product, right? Is that the product I got? No. So what does that mean about my assumption about it being SN2? It was wrong. This is where the memorization can come in. What you should be doing is memorizing that these reactions undergo SN1 type chemistry, which means the leaving group leaves on its own first, and I end up with a carbocation. What's the issue with carbocations? Carbocations are unstable, and so they should react very quickly. They should react very quickly with the most accessible electrons. The most accessible would be the closest thing to you. Where's the closest thing to that carbocation? The hydrogens next door, and we'd initiate a rearrangement. For those of you wondering what that curly Q is, okay, the only reason I do the curly Q is that seems to kind of stand out a little bit better as a rearrangement arrow. Okay, that's it. Okay, so we undergo a rearrangement, which then puts the positive charge on the tertiary position, the tertiary being more stable than the secondary. That was allowed, was an allowed rearrangement. Now the bromide can come in and permanently stabilize. I end up with the product shown. Okay? If you do rote memorization, you tend to draw just the bromide attached to where the alcohol was. So, oh, it just does the substitution. If you focus on the chemistry of what's happening at each of those stages, you can sometimes pick up the rearrangements. Okay? Kind of makes sense? Next one, how fast should that reaction occur? We said all of these reactions were which type of mechanism? SN1. The one type. How do we know it's SN? What changed? So you could say it's SN because it's not elimination, but by that same token, you'd also have to go through and say it's SN because it's not addition. It's SN because it's not radical. It's SN because it's not acid base. Right? So try to find the pattern. We're exchanging one group for another. That matches our substitution. Right? It's one type mechanism that's helpful to have memorized. Right? Under the one type mechanism, what would I expect to happen with that primary substrate? It shouldn't really happen. So that reaction should be very, very slow. Right? What? What type of mechanism do we run? SN1. You say that, I don't know why. Okay. Some of the why behind this comes from experiment. And most of our discoveries and the rules that we talk about are an experimental observation. 
How do we know it's SN1? I know it's SN1 because when I run the reaction above, I get a rearrangement. Could I get a rearrangement in that top reaction if it was SN2? SN2? No, I wouldn't. I know this one is SN1 because when I go in and test it, what's the timeline for it? It's very, very slow. So what we're showing here are the rules. These are the things that you should memorize. You need to know it's SN1 so that when you're asked the how fast does this happen, you can answer it's really, really slow. Okay? Which is really weird because we're making you memorize somebody else's experiment to then answer questions about their experiment. Yes, that is exactly what's happening. So are all SN1 reactions slow? Why is this particular SN1 reaction slow? For an SN1 reaction, what kind of substrate do I need? The substrate is which species? It's this carbon backbone. In particular, I'm looking at that carbon. Why that carbon and none of the others? That's where the chemistry is occurring. I want to look at that carbon. Describe that one carbon to me. It's primary. Does a primary carbon react in SN1 conditions? No, why not? So the tertiary reacts faster. True. And that's good. It's a fact. That's true. You need it, that information, yes. But why would the tertiary react faster than the primary? It's more stable. Why is the tertiary more stable? What about the tertiary? What are those more electrons doing to stabilize? What are they stabilizing? A carbocation, a positive charge. The primary carbocation can't form. There aren't enough electrons to stabilize it. I need the tertiary. Okay. So by you looking at the structure and knowing that it's SN1, this is a primary. The primary shouldn't react very quickly. This should be a very slow reaction. The next one. Okay. What happened there? What type of chemical reaction? An elimination. This one gets extra weird. If we ran the elimination, what would we expect to happen? We'd expect to eliminate those two pieces, right? Which means where would the double bond form? On the outside. Is that where it formed? No. What ends up happening? You can get a rearrangement, kind of, sort of. The double bond can react with water in the environment to reprotonate to form the carbocation here then you can eliminate a second time. Okay, All sorts of fun excitement. Last one. What happened there? It's a substitution reaction. Where did I get all those other carbons? I started with them. Okay, When I ran that reaction, most people assume that I only have one of those things. I don't have one. I have billions. One of them reacts with the acid to form a really good leaving group. A second one acts as a nucleophile, attacks, kicks out our leaving group, getting us our ether. So that one, could you have it be an SN1 to where that OH will leave and then another? Could you expect to see some SN1 characteristics show up in this? Yes. But primarily it's going to be more of an SN2. We would probably see SN2, and we would probably see this one run very, very slowly. Okay. What is different between the bottom one and the top one? Concentrated versus <coughs> dilute. Okay. Does it say dilute? No. All sorts of vagaries happen there. Sometimes it'll say dilute, sometimes not. Okay. We kind of have to deal with it. Okay. Why is it important that it's dilute? If it was concentrated, what happens to all of the oxygens? They all become protonated, which means no nucleophile. If it's dilute, I have some left over that weren't protonated. Those could act as nucleophiles. Okay. Um, what picks up the hydrogen off of the carbon when it, it adds? Which is a fun question. When we go through and do this, we end up with some hydrogens chilling out here. Where did those hydrogens go? Okay. When we run our chemical reactions, right, we mix two reagents together. Then typically what do you do in lab? You wash them. You add something neutral to them. 
Is the wash ever written into your mechanism? No. Is it assumed? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay. So seeing it neutralize, and again, that's one of those kind of vague systems. Usually it's assumed that the wash came through and removed that. So you just ended with like an oxygen that was positive, you would just assume from there it's being washed? Yep. Okay. Oops. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, for the bottom of the one type, the first time uh, the sulfuric acid knocks off the H and makes it O minus, and the second time around, no? So no, I, I can't, they can't do that. There's no strong nucleophile. Can you just run through that mechanism real quick for those who don't? Right? Now you have a potential for a good leaving group. This is why it's going to potentially run really slow. Why would it run slow there? Is that going to want to leave on its own? No. no. So we're likely going to have to have something force it off. What's the mechanism these run under? Why wouldn't it want to leave on its own? Why would it not want to leave on its own? Reference question two. It's primary. Okay, so this reaction is going to run very, very, very slowly because what we're waiting for is pretty much the perfect align. Did I get the carbons right? Yeah. Okay. We're waiting for effectively the perfect alignment for that thing to leave. Here's a carbocation snap. No, there's not. There's our positive oxygen. We don't want a positive oxygen. What happens? Something from solution. You'll see this pop up a lot. I'll just write B for base. base. Picks that up. What is that basic thing? It could be starting alcohol. It could be water. It could be the workup. Okay. We aren't consistent at all in specifying what that species is. So why can't the base take the hydrogen first before it is before it's that? What base? B, whatever you put down there. Okay. That's where this becomes careful. Okay. This is B as in re anything remotely basic, meaning something with electrons. Is this a strong base? No. How do you know it's not a strong base? Is it charged? No. no. Okay. That's how I know it's not strong. Here's another reason why I know it's not strong. I'm in a strong acidic environment. So when I'm talking about a base here, I'm saying something remotely basic meaning something with electrons. The only reason why I'm specifying B for base is that's what it's acting as here. Okay. What is that species? Like I said, it could be starting alcohol. It could be water that was eliminated from the structure. Okay. It could even be water that was added after the reaction was completed in the workup. It's assumed to be there. That's why I'm not specifying that base. Right, but I'm asking Okay, so let's go with the last condition because I think that's the best one. Okay. It's part of the workup. Is it present at the beginning? No, but... No, so it can't deprotonate it. Okay, so then let's run the next thing. Could the alcohol have deprotonated... Er, could this alcohol have lost the hydrogen? What would it pick it up? Another alcohol, right? You'd be forming what charged oxygen? What charged oxygen would you oh, be forming? A negatively charged oxygen in what kind of environment? Acidic. An acidic environment. Can you form a strong negative charge in an acidic environment? No. That's why that mechanism is wrong. You have to protonate it. This goes back again to what's the most reactive thing? I know you want to do this. You want to put those pieces together. You say, well, if it's negative, I can see how those pieces go. You have to evaluate the environment. The environment is acidic. You can't make a negative charge. You can't do it. It becomes wrong, which sucks, but that's the way it works. Okay. If we look at ethers, there's really two ways that we can go through and make ethers. We can make good leaving groups, or we can make good nucleophiles. And really, they're ultimately the same thing. Making a good leaving group, we just looked at. We protonate the oxygen. When the oxygen is protonated, it's now a great leaving group. It could potentially leave. Another alcohol comes in and attacks it. 
that secondary alcohol was not negatively charged, unfortunately, okay, as Mo wanted. And for good reasons, you wanted it to be negative, because okay, it increases the yield. Okay. It wasn't a strong nucleophile. Okay. That reaction is driven solely by the good leaving group characteristics. Okay. So that's a pretty piss poor synthesis. Taken with that, that only works for symmetric alcohols. Notice on this slide, it's symmetric. What if I wanted to make an asymmetric alcohol or ether? I'd have to mix two alcohols. Well, which alcohol gets protonated first? Okay, it will matter because it's going to be then a question of what it attacks, okay, or what is attacked by it. What it attacks or what attacks it, sorry. Okay. So in an asymmetric system, I can't just make the water a good leaving group. It doesn't work. I have to change the whole dynamics to get a higher yield of product. That's where we switch it up and we go through a good nucleophile. Okay. How can I make my alcohol a good nucleophile? Okay. So if we simplify this out, let's just make it two carbons here. I could remove the hydrogen. How do I remove that hydrogen? Strong base. Okay. I add a strong base. Because this is now a strong base, I can show B minus. And we'd have a negative charge. That negative charge now needs to attack another carbon structure. If we could turn that off, that'd be nice. Okay. We have to do this in two steps, typically. Because if we don't do it in two steps, we get a competition here. That negative charge needs to attack a carbon to make the other side of my ether, right? Okay. So there's my other carbon. What charge should that carbon be? It needs to be positively charged. How can I have that carbon come in positive? Because can I have just a positive carbon chilling? <coughs> no. What would be attached to that carbon to make it partially positive? A good leaving group like? Bromine, why'd you pick a halogen instead of, say, water or an alcohol? What can the bromides or the halogens only do? Leave. Leave. What could an alcohol do? A bunch of other chemistry. So now what happens? The negative can come in and tack, kick this out. We'd end up with our product, in this case, two carbons, oxygen, followed by are two carbons. Okay. Notice in this case I picked a symmetric ether and we're going to look here in a second on what could potentially happen with an asymmetric ether. But this is the basic pattern. Strong nucleophile. So I'm going to make the oxygen my strong nucleophile. To do so I have to add a strong base. This is exactly what you wanted to do, Mo. You wanted to make that a strong nucleophile. Okay. I can't just have that react with the alcohol because then I'd be ejecting hydroxide that's not a stable leaving group, and none of those species that are formed are stable. I have to react it with a secondary molecule. Okay, that secondary molecule will be my alkyl halide. Okay. For whatever reason, I still don't understand this one. Some reactions get names. This is one that gets names, and it makes no sense to me. None of this chemistry is difficult. Okay. None of this chemistry is like, oh, well, that shouldn't happen. All of that should happen. There's nothing questionable there. Yet, this synthesis gets known as the Williamson ether synthesis. It just is. Okay? So, strong base followed by your alkyl halide gets you your ether. Where this becomes important is if we think about synthesis. Okay? So we're going to take a look, because I want to move, unfortunately, faster than you probably want to. We're going to ignore MTBB, MTBE and only look at anisole. Anisole is what functional group? An ether. Okay? In that ether, I want to discuss or come up with a way to make that ether. And I want to approach it through a Williamson ether synthesis. 
What bonds in that structure are the weakest bonds? The carbon-oxygen bonds. So I have a red bond and a blue bond. Okay? Those are now my weak bonds, which means if I'm going to run this reaction to make this, I have to make one of those bonds. Which bond do you want to make, red or blue? Let's make the red one, okay? Because I'm thinking backwards, for whatever reason, we decided that this is our arrow for thinking backwards, okay? I'm going to cleave that bond, okay? I'm going to break it. Where did those electrons likely go, carbon or oxygen? oxygen. Why did they go to the oxygen? <coughs> what was our answer? Sorry, I didn't hear it. The oxygen is more electronegative, so the oxygen likely carries the negative charge. Okay. The other piece would be our CH3 positive. Can I form a primary carbocation? Rhymes with snow. Okay. Can I form a methyl carbocation? No. Okay, so I have to come up with some way to get that carbon to at least be partially positive, so I'm going to have to think one step further back. Okay, conveniently, we have the Williamson ether outlined above us. We need an oxide, a negatively charged oxygen, our strong base, our strong nucleophile, and we needed an alkyl halide. Okay, so what do I need to do to make that carbon a decent structure to start with? Put on a leaving group. What leaving group do I choose? Bromine. Why bromine? Okay. It can stabilize the charge. It can act as a decent leaving group. That's going to be a good option. Okay. If this is fully Williamson ether, I also have to explain where the ethoxide or the oxide came from. How did I get the oxide? I started with the alcohol, which technically is not an alcohol here, and I added a strong base, removed the hydrogen, I mixed that with the alkyl halide, and boom, there's my structure. Kind of, sort of? What if I'd done blue? Like, really, do I have to think about blue? If there's two possible ways to do it, what does that likely mean? One of them is probably wrong. If you picked the wrong one on that 50-50 flip, you got the answer wrong. Okay? So it's probably a good idea to draw out that structure and see what it potentially looks like. Yeah? We could take the oxide, the negative oxide, back to the alcohol. Nothing particularly fancy there. What could I do to the carbocation? I could stabilize that charge by reversing it backward to the alkyl halide. Okay, you ready for a brain breaker from first semester? Can I generate a positive charge on a benzene ring? No. In fact, hell no, that doesn't happen. But I don't have to worry about making the positive charge because this is under what mechanism? SN2. I know it's SN2 because strong nucleophile. So it's running SN2, the strong nucleophile does a backside attack on that carbon bromine, now I got my product. What are you going to complain about? There's no backside on this. It can't do a backside attack. What's on the backside of that carbon bromine bond? Electrons. What happens when the electrons of our nucleophile get near the electrons of the ring? Repulsion. Does this reaction work? No, the blue one actually fails is the wrong answer. The red one's now correct. Okay? So when we think about synthesis, it's always looking for that polarity, something to cause the bonds to potentially shift or break around, reverse that process, and then come up with structures. Once you have an answer, you must think back forwards and evaluate should that reaction actually happen. In the case of the blue, it can't. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Those of you thinking that takes a lot of work, it does. 
Synthesis is a painful system that requires lots of thought about all of the intricate pieces throughout the entire semester. What unfortunately also happens throughout this semester? We add more chemistry for you to access for synthesis. All right? For the record, synthesis is not on exam one. Chapter 13, I'm moving that homework. Okay? We'll move it. If you've already done it, that's practice for the first exam anyway, right? Because the questions they're asking you use reagents from the first unit that you are responsible for. Okay? Alternative activations. Okay? What looks different about these activations as opposed to the ones we just looked at? <coughs> What's that? Did you say they look different? You're like, I don't, I, don't challenge, I don't think they look different. They look the same. Is that what you're saying? What's the most reactive thing? Upper left corner. All right, let's switch it. What's the most reactive thing in the upper left-hand corner? Hydrogen. What makes these reactions different from the ones we just evaluated? All of the familiarity of the molecules has disappeared. Okay. You now have to evaluate these new symbols and structures. We aren't dealing with acid-base chemistry. So you're like, well, acid-base, that was all new to me too. You've spent two years studying acid-base chemistry. All of Gen Chem was acid-base chemistry. Okay. We've now made it more difficult by bringing in these other structures that don't have that obvious acid-base chemistry. So how could you go through an approach and try and think about which of those things is most reactive, say in the upper left-hand corner? Draw out the structure. If I draw out the structure for that species, what does it look like? Those are chlorines, by the way. Everybody seems to diss on my chlorines. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought they looked fine. I see an awful lot of electrons there, right? So maybe that acts as a nucleophile, right? Could the chloride act as a nucleophile? If chloride shares electrons, how many bonds would it have? Two. Do you like halogens with two bonds? No. So can chloride act as a nucleophile? No, I don't like that. Okay. Could the oxygen share electrons? <coughs> Potentially, but it's sp hybridized or sp2 hybridized, which means it's more electronegative than its sp3 counterpart, which means it's holding on to its electrons even tighter. So the oxygen can't act as a nucleophile, neither can the chlorides. What is the sulfur acting as? Do you see any electrons on it? What did you say? Could we do resonance? Could we do resonance? I mean, I think somebody potentially wearing a burgundy shirt, has said multiple times this semester that, that you should probably look at resonance structures because the first worst resonance structure can give you an idea of the chemistry. What charge builds on that sulfur? Positive. Should that sulfur, could that sulfur act as an electrophile? Yeah. Not only does it have a formal positive charge, what can you tell me about chlorine, particularly with respect to sulfur? More it's more electronegative. What can you tell me about oxygen with respect to sulfur? It's more electronegative. What can you tell me about the sulfur? That thing is really electrophilic. What is the oxygen going to do? React. It's going to react by attacking that electrophilic site. That causes a cascade of reactions within it where a chloride becomes ejected. We now have sulfur connected to our oxygen. Turns out that that now becomes a really good leaving group. Because it is a good leaving group, all I need is a nucleophile like a chloride that was just kicked out to come in and replace it. Anybody notice anything bizarre about the chemistry for that upper left one? It's not a backside attack. Okay, and... What mechanism does backside attack? SN2. So it's not backside attack, so that means it's not 
SN2. What does SN1 do? Both. How many products did I draw? One. Is it SN1? No. What is it? Fun. Okay. It's fun. It does it all at once with retention of stereochemistry. Okay. It maintains it. For those of you being like, God, that's kind of crazy. Hopefully you looked a little bit lower on that and encountered the next one underneath that says, SOC. that's the same thing, but what did it do? <coughs> it inverted stereochemistry, but what's under my hand? We add an extra little piece there, pyridine. That extra little piece changes the mechanism, and we now get SN2, and we get a backside attack. We have to be very careful when we look at SOCl2, also known as thionyl chloride, to pay attention to the conditions surrounding it. Typically, typically, it is done as inversion of stereochemistry. So you almost always see the presence of pyridine. Okay? Sometimes not. But for the most part, you see it with pyridine, and it's an expected inversion of stereochemistry. Why would we do that? And for those of you saying, because I hate you, why would I show you that it typically does inversion of stereochemistry? No, it's a, I'm being really, really nice, actually. If it typically does inversion of stereochemistry, does that fit a pattern that you already know? That fits the SN2 reaction. Why am I also mentioning that one? Because it also shows up every so often, but it's very, very rare. For the most part, it does inversion of stereochemistry. I want you to be aware of that kind of weird exception with it. Tossyl chloride, what happened? Or TSCl, what changed? The TS replaced the H. The oxygen stayed. Okay. Did the, anything happen to the carbon? No, which is why the stereochemistry stayed the same. It doesn't change the stereochemistry. It's only changing the oxygen. It's changing the oxygen to a phenomenal leaving group. PX3, okay, X4, halogens. We're looking for phosphorus with three halogens. Okay. Halogens all are electronegative, all sucking electrons away from the phosphorus, effectively giving us the same thing as our thionyl chloride under the nice conditions. And we end up with an inversion of stereochemistry. Okay? Why would we go through to put chlorines on instead of oxygen? The chlorides are less reactive than the alcohol. If I'm trying to limit chemistry or only do chemistry at that one spot, now I can zero in and focus on it. The alcohol could potentially cause a mess. Okay? Same deal with the lower X. OTS. OTS is really just a way of making a really good leaving group. That's it. Okay? So it's almost always followed by some other kind of substitution chemistry. And so for the alcohol, earlier we talked about that it's going to be SN1. Now obviously this is now SN2. This is because now it's not being chronated. Yes. Okay. Yep. It all has to do with the stability of each of those leaving groups in those processes. So our thionyl chloride, that gets us our sulfur. Okay? In the presence of pyridine, what ends up happening, which is an interesting feature we'll see in a second, is the pyridine actually comes in and replaces that chlorine and makes it sterically hindered. That steric hindrance is what's actually dictating the inversion or retention of stereochemistry. Okay. So I think that chemistry is really neat because you can get inversion or not. Okay. If we were considering our mechanism, we would kind of assume inversion of stereochemistry because the chloride should have come in from the backside. Okay. It really depends on that pyridine. Okay. This functional group or this chemistry is really, really neat because it doesn't work on alcohols only. It works on all OHs. What other functional group has an OH? A carboxylic acid. Thionyl chloride will turn the OH on a carboxylic acid into a chlorine. Okay, that's pretty powerful. Okay, which we'll see in second, or not second semester, in the third unit, I believe. 
right? If we run without pyridine, the chloride on our sulfur immediately comes back, attacks, and kicks out our leaving group, okay? And one of the things that we always question is something about the leaving group. The leaving group here is SO2, okay? Anybody cracked open an egg and been like, oh, that's rotten? I've never done that, actually, but some people seem to know it. SO2 is actually the rotten egg smell. Thionyl chloride is really awful to work with because it produces sulfur dioxide gas, which is insanely nasty smelling. Okay. The other thing that's really nice about this is what does the gas then do? It leaves the system. If it leaves the system, what happens with that reaction arrow? It only goes to the product. So we get virtually quantitative yields. That means 100%, okay? So it's a good reagent in that respect, okay? What's the other byproduct of this reaction? I see H plus, and didn't it come in as SOCl2? Yeah, there's another Cl floating around. It produces hydrogen chloride gas, also known as hydrochloric acid, when it is breathed into your lungs. Yeah. So it's an unpleasant reagent both for smell and for the survivability of your life. Um, so it's generally done in a hood and with a bubbler system so that the acid gas gets trapped into a base solution and we don't breathe it in. And it also <laughs> theoretically traps the sulfur dioxide so you don't have to smell it. Okay. Okay. Pyridine is the neat thing. Pyridine is what causes this. The pyridine comes in, does the substitution, replaces the chloride. Okay. Now we don't have a good way to transition. This is why the chloride does the backside attack. Okay. In the presence of pyridine, we don't really have SOCl2. We have SO pyridine chloride. Okay. And it is that species that forces the inversion in stereochemistry. Okay. We do have to be very, very careful with the reagent. Right? If it's with pyridine inversion without retention, okay, I have seen reactions going both ways in multiple different tests and textbooks. Okay? So please be careful and pay attention for that pyridine with this reagent. Okay? The phosphorus, pretty much the same thing. The phosphorus has three electron withdrawing bromines. The oxygen attacks, kicks out a bromine, and we end up forming, oh, did I not draw it? Oh, I did, there it is. Okay. A decent leaving group, which I don't even show, that's nice. Okay. We form a phosphorus oxide leaving group. The phosphorus oxide is stable as a leaving group, which is why the bromide can come in and attack. Again, backside attack. Okay. Why are all of these backside attack and the previous ones weren't? Look at the size of the leaving groups. Okay? We've got four atoms. The thionyl chloride, <laughs> at least three atoms, okay? and all fairly large atoms. When we looked at the acid activation, it was water as a leaving group. Oxygen and two hydrogens. How big is hydrogen? Tiny. Okay? So it sterically doesn't block a whole lot. These reagents all block a whole lot, and so typically favor inversion of stereochemistry. In all of these cases, because we're seeing an inversion of stereochemistry, our mechanism is SN2. SN2. Okay. Uh, oh, I think that was a fun note there. Um, just like thionyl chloride, phosphorus tribromide or phosphorus trichloride also works with carboxylic acids. So they would also be converted across to the halide. The tossel, okay, tossel is referencing, or TS is referencing a tossel, which is toluene sulfonic, okay, or toluene sulfol. So you have toluene, aromatic green with a methyl, followed by the sulf piece out there. What's the squiggly supposed to represent in this case? Whatever it's connected to. If it's an OH, what have I made? Okay. 
Let's, let's do a little bit more creativity. Let's get rid of the tosyl and actually just put another OH on. What have I made? Sulfuric acid. When I have an OH there, this becomes toluene sulfonic acid. Okay. Its acidity is roughly that of sulfuric acid. Why would I use this instead of sulfuric acid? What does this have a lot of? Mm, true. The atoms? Carbons. The carbons get us our nonpolar uh, structures or nonpolar forces, which allows toluene sulfonic acid to be more soluble in organic solvents than sulfuric acid. So that's why it typically gets used. Okay. In this case, if we switch the squiggle to a chloride, what do I now have? That sulfur should start to look kind of like the sulfur in thionyl chloride. What ends up happening? The sulfur becomes an electrophile. Oxygen can go ahead and attack the sulfur, kick out the chloride. In this case, I can't get the chloride to come back in and attack because the concentration of the chloride isn't high enough. So instead, what happens is instead of having an H attached to this, I have that giant tosyl group. What could the oxygen do to this, the sulfur group? Begins with R. Resonance, we now have a really good leaving group. That good leaving group could then be substituted in a secondary step. Okay. After that, we've got our epoxides, but we're already too late, so we have to stop.